Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to have our special guest. Claire Rizzoli, who's here from Focha, LA. Bravo. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Thank you so much for being with us. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I'm really excited to just kind of dive in and get to know you a little bit more, get to know how you got started, what's your business all about, you know, challenges, successes, all of those things we're going to cover today. And I know you're going to be an inspiration for everyone that's listening to our interview today. So welcome everyone, all our listeners. And just to kind of get us started, I, I want you to kind of just take the mic and just tell us a little bit about who you are. Who's Claire? Um, tell us whatever you want to share about who you are. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Claire Rasoli, and I feel like I have reinvented myself probably four or five times in my almost 50 years on this planet. <laughs> I am a mom, uh, first and foremost, and I live in South uh, LA, and I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, my mom's from Sonora, Mexico. My dad's from Brooklyn, New York. Um, so I am Mex-ish. My dad's Jewish and my mom, uh, he's from Eastern European descent and my mom's from Mexico. Very interesting combination, but I think perfect for LA. Um, so I grew up here in LA. Um, oh my gosh. Um, and I'm not kidding when I say that I reinvented myself. Um, in my teens and early 20s, I was a signed recording artist. I was signed to MCA Records. I was um, in a girl group called Girls Town. Don't even bother looking us up. We never um, really launched. <laughs> we were one of those um, artists or one of those acts that got signed and shelved. We were singing um, R&B music. Um, that was in the early 90s. And then um, I moved on to a career in Latino marketing and advertising. I realized at some point that I better go to school. My mom came to this country for the American dream. And I was the first of over 40 cousins to go to college. Mm -hmm. And I graduated college at almost 30 years old but also at the same time working in the field of experiential marketing and Latino um, marketing and advertising. Um, worked in that field for, oh my gosh, like close to 10 years. Didn't love it, but I was just sort of riding the horse in the direction that it was running. Um, I was introduced to a company called Arbon, which is a health and wellness um, network marketing company. Um, never imagined doing anything like that in a million years, but the woman who introduced it to me, I was very intrigued by, she was a very successful, um, advertising executive in New York city. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. And I just tried out something new and then found myself, um, in that industry and in network marketing for over 12 years. I'm actually still, um, an independent consultant and executive national vice president with Arbonne International. Um, I was told that I'm one of those people that you hear about that you never hear about <laughs> in one of those those kinds of businesses. Um, but I really embraced it and really learned a lot about um, the industry, the profession, network marketing, and really just fell in love with the company, the brand, the mission, the products, um, the plant-based um, toxin-free ingredients, and just, you know, all of that. Yeah. And then... Um, I'm big into, um, not big into, but I have fun with vision boards um, every year. I've been doing them for about 10 years. Um, I used to think it was kind of like funny and woo woo, um, but something that, uh, you know, I just started having fun with and doing with my, my son, just, you know, kind of putting out every year what I wanted to um, create. So in, in January, 2019, um, I, printed out the word pocha and put it on my vision board because um, I always believed in multiple streams of income. And I guess I was getting a little restless in, in that career. I had achieved a certain level and probably took it for granted. Um, I recognize that now that I probably, you know, didn't have the gratitude that I needed to maintain. And it's one thing to build to a certain level. It's another thing to stay at a certain level. And then it's another thing to grow beyond that level. So I got very comfortable, you know, you get very comfortable with a, a certain level of, I'll call it perceived success. Yeah. 
And uh, I thought, you know what, I, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting antsy. I'm getting restless. I, I, I want to do something else. I want to diversify. So I continued to build my Arbon business, but had saved up a significant amount of money and thought, I want to, I want to launch a brand. I want to launch my own brand. I never really thought about having like my own restaurant per se, like just being like a, you know, a small restaurant owner was never like in my, like my realm of like goals or consciousness. I really wanted to build a brand. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I would love to build a brand around an idea and a culture um, or, or a, an experience that um, is nurturing, that's building community, um, that uh, brings people together. I love food. Mm -hmm. I love experiences. I love hosting. I love um, just bringing people together. So I thought, okay, a, a restaurant that'd make the most sense for this brand, Bocha. That um, idea was on the vision board in January, 2019. In February, 2020, I was signing a lease to a location in Highland Park. Now, mind you, I don't have any um, like traditional um, management experience. Um, I've never managed a restaurant. I don't have any commercial kitchen experience. I'm just crazy. <laughs> I just get, you know, wild ideas and I don't know, do them. Um, so yeah, that was February, 2020. And then, you know, we were fixing the place up and trying to spruce it up make it look pretty, give it a little facelift with our champagne taste and our beer budget. Um, Prior to Pocha, this location had been a restaurant for almost 40 years. It was like a landmark, another uh, another uh, restaurant, Mexican restaurant concept. So it needed a lot of TLC. The buildings, you know, old. Um, let's call it seasoned. <laughs> Lots of character. <laughs> Lots of character. Um, so you know, we were trying to make it look uh, nice, just to, you know, to get it started. And then we we're, you know, in March 2020, kind of start hearing things about this coronavirus or whatever that was. You know, to me, it seemed like well, that happens over there. You know, yeah. that just happened over here. It's somewhere over there, not here. Um, then it really started getting real, as we all know. You know, in middle of March, there was a global shutdown that was supposed to last two weeks, and we opened our doors to just take out and delivery April 2020. Um, with, you know, the hopes of two weeks to flatten the curve. And two years later, we were still trying to flatten the curve. <laughs> yeah, wow. So it was wild. And, you know, I, I knew that it was going to be hard. I knew the restaurant business is one of the hardest, you know, businesses out there. I didn't know that I was going to be opening up a business in one of the hardest hit industries, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and, and I knew it was going to take a certain amount, certain level of work and, um, grit. Um, and honestly, all I know is opening up a restaurant during the pandemic. I don't really have any other benchmark yeah, yeah. Um, to compare it to. It was hard and I knew it was going to be hard, but somehow we've moved from barely hanging on surviving to glimpses of thriving. <laughs> so here I am almost uh, three and a half years later in a new restaurant venture. And I guess pretty soon I'll be able to say, I don't know what the heck I'm doing and just know that I'm just doing it and the learnings and the doing. And sometimes the learning's really painful. Well, I, I thank you for sharing that, that story and kind of walking us through, but I agree with you. I mean, I think like the journey of the entrepreneur, the business owner is, is not an easy one. And, you know, I just love your space. I love, for those of you that are listening that haven't been to Pochela, you need to go. It is just such a warm, beautiful, calming. I'm sure when there's a lot of cool, loud music, maybe it's not as calming. It's more, you know, vibrant <laughs> energy, <laughs> but such a great energy walking in through those doors. And your team is amazing. You are incredible. And I just, I love the layout of kind of how you put it together. So tell us a little bit more about that, like what the environment that you wanted to create for folks and also the, the types of food, because I think, you know, that's obviously part of the business is like the, the type of food that you sell, because it is delicious. Thank and you. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> I, I really think it's, I'm try, always trying to think like, when can I go back out there, you know, to have some good food? So share a little bit about your food and just about kind of the setup, the environment. Yeah. So um, 
I am not a chef. Um, you know, I love to cook, but you know, I, I cook at home and sometimes things turn out great and sometimes, <laughs> you know, chalk it up to, uh, an experiment. Um, but honestly, um, pocha is because we are, and I say that because I am really just a small part of, of pocha. I mean, it was definitely an idea, but the people that I've surrounded myself with that have come forth and have dedicated their time and their love and their passion and their energy and their knowledge is what's really, what's really brought this to life. So the menu is a juxtaposition of things that I love, um, that I grew up eating that um, felt like home to me, like the braised brisket is really like, to me, it's barbacoa. Um, the chile verde, um, we have some really traditional um, platillos, but we also, you know, it's a modern experience without compromising tradition. The mole, uh, poblano is made from scratch. I love mole. I try mole wherever I go. And uh, I have to say, like, ours really does measure up. Like, when I go, I was just in Mexico City in um, last October, and anywhere they served mole poblano, I tried it just to see, like, where we measured up. I tried chilaquiles everywhere. I tried huevos y borciados everywhere. Like, everything that I could find on the menu that we served, I just wanted to see, like, how do we measure up? And we do. Like, I'm really proud of what we oh. serve. And um, the kitchen, I mean, the kitchen collectively probably has over 125 years experience. Um, and I would say none of our kitchen staff um, is probably is like professionally trained. It really is just a soulful contribution um, that they bring to the table. And so a lot of it is just a collaborative effort. Like, you know, um, we have this policy or this um, understanding like, hey, if there's something that you want to introduce as if, if there's something that you want to share, if there's something that, you know, you want to make for us, like that's how a lot of the menu items came to be where, you know, Leo would make something for us and we'd be like, oh my God, we love it. We need to put that on the menu or, you know, we would just um, modify it. So our menu is definitely an evolving living thing. You know, it grows, it expands, it contracts, <laughs> depending on, you know, um, just what people um, want. Um, so that's really, you know, our menu is just things that, that we love, that I think people love. We also are catering to some of the more modern food trends. We have some plant-based options. Um, that's a growing market. Again, you know, my background is in, in experiential marketing. So I do have a little bit of that um, to contribute or to bring to the table as well. It's like, you know, there's, there's, you have to pay attention to what people want and what people need and what the, what the market is demanding. Um, so, you know, I try to be conscious of that as well. And then as far as the space, um, well, the restaurant was a house for many years um, before it was the prior restaurant, Villa Sombrero, which was there for uh, uh, over 30 years. So the layout is, you know, it's very homey. <laughs> it, it literally was a home. Um, one of the silver linings of COVID um, was that, you know, this whole alfresco dining concept was introduced. You know, restaurants were only able to, if not just take out and delivery, offer outdoor dining. So we had, we created a, a front patio um, so that we could accommodate, you know, outdoor diners. And then we had this back patio that I learned after signing the lease because I didn't read the fine print. I didn't know what I was doing anyways. I should have gotten a lawyer, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> but what I learned was that uh, this outdoor patio wasn't even permittable permissible, what's the word? It wasn't even a permitted area where we could serve food or drinks. So we had this outdoor dining, or I'm sorry, this outdoor space, this outdoor patio that was dilapidated and wasn't even a permitted zone to serve food. Then COVID comes around and then there's this alfresco dining permit thing that's, you know, that's given to restaurants. And now we're here three and a half years later, and I don't think they're going to be able to put that genie back in the bottle. So we've intercepted this beautiful outdoor area that we've been sprucing up um, and this uh, front patio area, 
which has been super exciting because, you know, we live here in beautiful, sunny Southern California where we just love being outside and the weather really lends itself to that. Um, but it's also really challenging on the kitchen because this is a tiny kitchen and it was designed to be able to, to serve the inside dining area only. So when we fill up the back patio and the front patio and all the dining rooms inside, like we're like the little engine that could in there, like <laughs> cranking, kicking butt. <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. And that's beautiful. I mean, I think the the outdoor space, you really have made good use of the space and people do like to have the option to be inside and outside. So yeah. And great. and just to speak to um you know, the, the calming, um, experience vibes. I mean, that's, I really wanted it when I dreamt of Pocha, I really wanted it to be a place where people could, um, gather, build community, um, enjoy, um, you know, time conversation, great food. I wanted it to be chill and feel like home. Mm. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, it sounds like, um, it's kind of, it's kind of coming across. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say it shines through and it shines through from all of you. I think that's, that's what, that's what people are feeling. That's what's manifesting in your walls outside of your walls. So that's yeah. definitely, um, yeah, one of my favorite things about it. Um, so let's, let's, uh, we talked, we learned a lot about kind of the business and kind of how it came to be. And let's back up a little bit and, and learn a little bit more about Claire and kind of you growing up in your childhood and your niñez, como dicen. How mm -hmm. was that for you, like growing up? We want to know the kind of full Claire from when you were little, like what kind of kid were you? Did you dream of, you know, entrepreneurship and did you have that creativity or how was it for you growing up? So just share a little bit with us about that and kind of your background. Great. Um, so I grew up in South Torrance. Um, and at that time there were not a lot of Latinos. So, um, my parent, when my parents got married, my mom actually did not speak English and my dad did not speak Spanish. Don't ask me yeah. how that worked, but it did until it didn't. Um, <laughs> so I was home, you know, with my, with my mom, uh, during the day, my dad was working. And by the time I got to kindergarten, um, and I, you know, had my first day of school, like I didn't speak English. Um, and I didn't know that everyone else didn't speak Spanish. So that was a little, um, I guess my, my first experience in feeling like I don't fit in. Yeah. Um, and as a kid, you know, I think so, so badly we want to fit in as we get older, it's when we want to stand out. Mm -hmm. So, um, I definitely felt different. Um, for some reason, um, I felt, um, less than I grew up in a, you know, in an upper middle class neighborhood. Um, and my mom cleaned, ha cleaned houses. She had a cleaning business. So I was like one of her best employees. <laughs> um, and I didn't know that that like that everybody wasn't doing that. So I, I it's always interesting when I talk about just like my my multicultural or bicultural bilingual experience. Like I didn't grow up in, you know, East L.A. or um, Boyle Heights or where there was like a predominant Latin community. I actually grew up in a really um, white and Asian community. Um, so it was, you know, it's still, it's a different experience, different nuances. So I grew up uh, cleaning houses with my mom. Um, my dad had two master's degrees. He was a, an engineer and my mom just wanted to make her own money. Um, you know, it wasn't out of um, I guess necessity, but it was, you know, she wanted to have her own business. She wanted to make her own money. Yeah. And my dad would like, loved it, supported it, embraced it, helped her make her business cards. It was, you know, it was, it was great, yeah. but I didn't know that, you know, everyone wasn't doing that. And I didn't know that it was kind of like, I don't know, I, I kind of made to feel different. Now I feel so proud and I have a yeah. sick work ethic because of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, as I started growing up and then becoming a little bit more like Americanizada, because of where, you know, I started answering my mom in English, or I started um, being like embarrassed, like, you know, when my friends would come over that weren't Latino and would see like, 
I remember this um, specifically, like um, we would make tacos de lengua and we had like a big cow tongue defrosting in the sink. <laughs> and my friend was like, ew, gross. Like, oh my God, it's so gross. And I told everyone at school and I was totally embarrassed because everybody wasn't eating, you know, lengua. Everyone wasn't, you know, bringing um, food for lunch that smelled weird or smelled different. Like I wasn't eating ham and cheese sandwiches and peanut butter and jelly. Like that just wasn't, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there was um, a sense of feeling like I didn't fit in. And then we would go to Mexico to Sonora where my mom was from. And then like my Spanish kind of got like, you know, bocha, like mm -hmm. it went from being Spanish dominant to <laughs> yo no sabo, you know, <laughs> I'm not a, it wasn't that bad, but still, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so then I would get this reputation of being like, you know, pocha, que ella es muy americanizada, que ella no habla, habla en el español. And so I was just like, oh my God, like, I don't know, like, where I fit in. I don't even know what box to check off. Like, what am I? And it just like, it, it went on um, all through high school until um, after high school. I don't know what it was about after high school, but like, I really just um, wanted to dominate the language. I wanted it. Back. I wanted to feel the confidence. I, um, you know, was at that time pursuing music and I wanted to be able to sing in both languages. And so I would listen to only music in Spanish and buy books and magazines in Spanish and read them out loud and try to speak as much Spanish as I could, like any opportunity, which is great here in LA. Like you can speak Spanish all day long. Like you don't even have to speak English here. Um, so I just really started, um, getting just connected to my roots and finding my, my identity, like not what I thought I was supposed to be, but just like really getting in touch with what felt true to me. Um, and I loved it. Uh, and uh, I started embracing the word pocha because when I was called it, um, I hated it. And I think there was a lot of us that really hated it. It made me feel like I was, it just brought up a lot of not enough -edness. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I just, I really started embracing the word, um, and having gratitude for, you know, how cool is that, that I get three cultures, like I get this Mexican culture that's so rich and this American culture that, you know, we're, we're, I mean, I'm, I'm proud to, to be from here. There's like, I say, I'm pocha y que, like, it's like, you say it like, it's a bad thing. Like, it's not horrible. Like we're really, I think there's a pride that comes with, you know, this wonderful country, whether we, you know, love all the things that are happening or not, like there's still a sense of pride of, mm -hmm. you know, it's a great place. And then having this Mexican American culture. So I just got the, the best of like three worlds. Um, and uh, really started embracing it. Always have had an entrepreneurial bug, um, tried working in the corporate space, um, knew it wasn't for me, but like I said earlier, I was just riding the horse in the direction that was running. I always wanted to have my own business. My mom had an entrepreneurial sp spirit. Um, my mom, by the way, she would kill me for telling you guys this, but I'm going to. My mom doesn't have more than a third grade education and she is one of the most astute street smart people I know she's number three of 11 kids she grew up on a ranch with dirt floors no electricity um we used to go back home her home you know two three times a year and it was so cool to get that 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 juxtaposition of cultures of yeah. you know of experiencing where my mom came from and then experiencing you know the big city where where my dad came from and by the way my dad was like madly in love with my mom that was really cool too <laughs> and he was like super educated and my mom you know isn't like you know book school educated but incredibly smart so i love having um those two worlds and i believe i'm both <laughs> you know we we're, we're all just a, a juxtaposition of everything that we've been influenced by so always had the entrepreneurial spirit, kind of dipped my toes in with these, with, you know, this, this health and wellness company, Arbon Network Marketing. Um, although it wasn't like my baby, I didn't build it from the ground up. It wasn't my brand. It's, it's not my brand. I love it. I love the company. I love everything that it stands for, but it's not something that I built with you know, my DNA and my fingerprints. So that's where I think, you know, Pocha, the restaurant, Pocha Los Angeles is, has been my outlet for that to be able to express myself 
um, creatively and in that um, in that entrepreneurial spirit, it's definitely definitely coming out. It's the hardest thing I've ever done next to being a mom. <laughs> I mean, and and so many people that resonates with so many people. You know, I think the the being identifying as pocha or being called that at one point and not embracing it, right? I think that that's I personally have also encountered that you know, in my life. And you share about your mom, similar, my mom cleaned houses and I would go to work with her too. And I, all of those experiences, long-term experiences really are a part of who you are. And it, it, it's infused in your DNA, as I say, because it is that the work ethic you have, I firmly believe it's because of all of those experiences you had, the, the appreciation you had for hard work, the not taking the easy route, like, you know, the, your mom being an intelligent woman and being able to do something like this and having the courage to do it. I mean, all of these qualities are those that are you know, transferred, I'll say, to our children, or in this case, you, who, were, who was able to experience that with her to a certain mm-hmm. level. Um, and, and definitely why I think you're standing tall right now and, and have your business and are exploring other opportunities, always finding a way and not yet through all of that, the goods, the, what is it? The highs and the lows is not losing sight of community and being grounded in that, you know, I think that's just really important. And it's, it, I say all this because I see it, like, I'm just, I'm, I'm verbalizing kind of what I hear and I see in you. And so I think that um, for those that are listening, that are doubting themselves or that are, you know, not quite sure, you know, embrace your story is kind of the, one of the big things I'm hearing from you, Claire, is like, just embrace all of who you are, because it's going to get you to where you need to be, right, and give you that strength, so thank you, thank you for sharing that, and as you're sharing, you know, I know you talked about, like, the concept of, and, you know, how Pocha was born, Pocha LA, why, why it exists, What's kind of your greater purpose and mission with your business, but also for yourself? Like, what do you see that bigger purpose being all about? Oh, that's such a great question. And sometimes I think it depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Today? Yeah. What's that? I said it could change. Yeah. Yes. Um, I actually was just having this conversation earlier. Um, it can change. and. I think we have to be okay with it changing. Sometimes, you know, when I first set out to do this, um, I didn't, I didn't talk about this in in my trajectory, but in my late teens through my twenties for about 10 years, I worked at California pizza kitchen. I actually worked for the two guys that started California pizza kitchen, Rick and Larry. And this was when they just had a couple locations and it was before like the, it was right before like the really explosive years. Mm-hmm. And I jokingly say that I learned more working there than I did in college. And I joke, but I'm kind of serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a server, but then I also became a server trainer. So I helped open up new locations and train the front of house staff in uh, Manhattan Beach, Paradise Valley, Phoenix, Scottsdale, had the opportunity to, you know, help roll out some new locations and and train. So I love what these, what they built. They were like, you know, two Beverly Hills lawyers. Okay. They had a lot more startup capital and a way better network to start with. Um, I'm the sole investor. Sorry, that's my dog Paco in the background, but real life is happening over here, people. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was able to see what they had built um, and I was super inspired by it. And I thought, well, I would love to, you know, do something like that. So when I set out to do Pocha, I thought I want to do what Rick and Larry did, but, you know, with, with the Pocha brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, some days I still want to see that through and other days I'm not sure I could even handle it. Like I want to enjoy my life. I want to enjoy my time. Um, I want to enjoy my son. Um, And these days, I mean, time is really the only currency I really care about. (laughs) 
mm-hmm. time. Um, we're here for a short time and I really want to enjoy it. And even though I have, you know, really big plans and really big goals, um, some days I just feel like maybe, you know, maybe what I've built um, is, is enough. Maybe I'll just pause right here. I definitely want to make a difference in the community. Um, I definitely want um, to use it as a vehicle to um, help, to um, contribute um, on a way larger scale. Um, I'm not sure how how I'm going to do that yet. Um, right now, you know, I've had the opportunity to to donate or to sponsor events or to donate to like student film um, crews. Um, you know, as their as the caterer. Um, you know, when we can do that. Um, I love to be able to do that. You know, when I thought about growing Pocha and making it a household name, of course, I've thought about, you know, some sort of nonprofit, um, maybe some sort of um, foundation to um, teach um, leadership, uh, entrepreneurship to um, communities that don't have as much access. Um, You know, those are the things that I'm mulling around um, in my brain. Today, um, full transparency, I'm not sure how much more I could handle. It's really hard. Um, And my son's going into high school. You know, um, I think as a single mom, and by the way, when I say single mom, I always make sure I I qualify it with, I have a very great co-parenting relationship with his dad, because I realized when I used to say single mom, what he heard was absent dad. He's not an absent dad. So I have to make sure that like, that like I'm a single mom, but it's a different, you know, it's not like I'm doing this on my own. Um, you know, uh, I used to think that I had to be really present and available when he was a baby and he was a little boy. And that's absolutely true. But now that he's going into high school, I feel like, you know, that's, I I cannot take my finger off the pulse. So I'm just trying to figure out how to balance it all. And I also know that part of entrepreneurship um, is, you know, balance is sort of a myth. There's seasons of balance. There's seasons of intensity. There's seasons of, you know, planting seeds and, and growth and, Uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, but, um, I guess that's a long-winded question for, I'm, I'm not sure yet, but I'm open. I'm open to opportunities. Um, maybe I need a partner. Maybe right now I've been doing this on my own. Um, that used to feel like so empowering. Now I'm just like, I'm open. (laughs) Well, like you said, your motherhood is not, is also not easy. That's its own journey. Right. And so you're kind of going through with your with your son, with your child, whatever they're also experiencing in life. It's like they they're not alone either because a parent is there. Right. And going through that with them. So that along with the business and, you know, any other things that come up, because we know life, there's always unexpected in life. Um, but, um, motherhood clearly drives you as well. And like what you're trying to do and what you're building. And, um, and I appreciate you saying that it's not easy because, uh, again, it's, we don't want to portray kind of this mythical experience, right? There's, there's the challenges and there's the successes too, of feeling either personally successful or seeing the outcomes we want to see. And then there's the times when, you just, you can't. And I think the balance is, like you said, I like to use the word integration because you're in, you're into, you're like, it's an integration of your personal and professional, in this case, your business life, right? It fuses together yeah. because you're also doing this from a very, per- no one's telling you, Claire, put this restaurant here, do the, do, 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 right? It comes from this desire inside internally to do this. And so that is a part of who you are on the day to day. It's not, something that is over there and you're over here you know yeah and it's fun you know integrating my son into the experience like I bring him to work with me um by the way he's a he's a great little cook like he really loves the kitchen um will he pursue that I don't know um but he's you know enjoying uh working with me he's in he's learning a lot it's kind of cool to you know, see him there at 14 years old, he was influenced by it at probably, you know, 11, 12 years old. And just seeing him um, just learn skills like 
how to talk to people, how to welcome people. Um, it's really cute. You know, one time uh, there was a wait um, and he was greeting people and, you know, it took a few minutes to see people. And instead of saying, you know, um, sorry about the wait, he said, oh, we'll be right with you. Thank you for your patience. And I just thought, wow, what an empowering place to come from. Because, I mean, it's not that we're not sorry that there's a wait, but to say, you know, thank you for your patience versus I'm sorry for the wait is just, you know, he's, he's learning a lot, just how to interact, how to lead, um, how to uh, anticipate people's needs, um, customer service, how to answer the phone, how to, um, you know, communicate to, you know, the, the, the kitchen who's predominantly Spanish and then the front of house, well, front of house is like mostly bilingual, but he's just influenced by so much. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I can, um, integrate him into that experience. Um, so I don't, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where we're going to end up, but I know that he will be able to take all these lessons with him and channel them and apply them mm -hmm. somewhere. So I was going to say, that's the legacy you're building. Who knows if you would have had that experience if you wouldn't have this restaurant, right? Yeah. You, you weren't a business owner. Like, would he learn these skills? Maybe he would, but maybe he wouldn't, right? So you're giving him that experience and that space. So that's really, it's a beautiful thing. I think I, I'm going to send my son to go. <laughs> Are you <laughs> taking volunteers? I'm going to send my son to go work with you. Yeah, <laughs> send him over. <laughs> you're all going into high school too and I'm like you got to learn these skills you know these are lifelong skills and they don't teach you this in school so yeah that's that's really great so you touched a little bit on kind of you know it's not easy and it's challenging and so we want to touch on that a little bit just to kind of open you know the doors to that conversation around normalizing really struggle right um mm -hmm. Because what we see sometimes on, you know, TikTok or on TV, it's the glamorized version of business ownership. And, you know, clearly it's, it's, it's not all peaches, as they say, and, and, and some of it is, but it's not always that. And there's struggles and there's challenges and there's tears and, you know, there's berriches or, <laughs> you know, and so yeah. can you share um, what you feel comfortable sharing, uh, a challenge or a struggle that you've had um, or that you faced and, and how either you overcame it or how you are overcoming it. So it may be something that you're and again, it doesn't mean that there's an answer, right? It just means like, how are you kind of managing that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for, um, for bringing it up <laughs> because, um, you know, I hear it often, uh, you know, people will say, oh my gosh, like I see you like on social media or I see you on Instagram or I see you on Facebook and like, oh my God, it looks like you're doing, like you're doing so great. And I'm all, and I always say, <laughs> is that what it looks like? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Cause you're looking at my highlight reel. <laughs> you're not like, I don't really, sometimes I'll post something that's really raw and vulnerable. Like that's more behind the scenes, but honestly, my voice, I really try to keep it positive. Um, you know, on, on social media, I really, I really do, but, um, it is the highlight reel. Um, I, you know, my son has had to pull me out of the walk-in fridge, um, having a major meltdown, uh, mm -hmm. on multiple occasions. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a time when I, uh, met with the bankruptcy attorney cause it was looking like that was where I was headed. Mm -hmm. I signed a personal guarantee, um, on a 10 year lease and there was a hot minute there where I didn't think I was going to make it. Mm -hmm. um, there was another time when I had to uh, pull out a home equity line of credit against my home to keep Pocha afloat. Um, I'm still trying to pay that thing down. Mm -hmm. There, um, you, you know, I talked briefly about my other business. In my other business, um, I built a massive business. I was a corporate trainer. We had our 
um, global training conferences in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Arena. I would train in front of 18,000 people and I have pictures with like me on the jumbotron, uh, you know, in a full arena of 18,000 people. And I took that picture with a picture that um, I took of myself one day that I came into Pocha like a year and a half ago. Uh, it was a rainy day. It was flooded. And I was there by myself. And I put the two pictures side by side of me main stage on the MGM Grand Arena on the Jumbotron in front of 18,000 people, and me mopping the floors and trying to clean up the flood at um, Pocha. And I, I think it was titled like, what the hell happened to me? <laughs> Um, you know, there's days where I just feel like I can't take one more thing. There's days where, you know, we have months where it's a explosive record breaking month to the next week, counting pennies, am I going to make payroll? Um, am I going to be able to pay my vendors? Um, it's just a very, like I said, you know, the highs are really high and the lows are really low. But you just keep on going because you just learn what you're made of. Like you, you really do learn what you're made of. I mean, you can either buckle or keep going. You can either roll over or, um, you know, make it happen or figure it out. You just have to get really resourceful. You got to go over it, under it, around it, through it. You got to figure it out. And I don't think for me, I'll speak for myself, you know, I don't think I realized whatever it takes means or what it meant until I was in a situation or in situations where I had to do whatever it took. It was either lose my house or make it happen, take out a HELOC or, you know, lose it. Or, you know, I was just, you do what you got to do. Um, and you also realize if you follow enough success stories, success leaves clues. And I don't know about you, but I haven't read yet a, like a success story about anybody who's created anything significant that hasn't had, you know, challenges, obstacles, letdowns, Right. Order, you know, on the brink of losing it all, pushing through. I mean, those are the stories that we love. Those are the ones that keep us going. How boring, boring is a success story or unrealistic is one that, you know, I started a business and I shot straight to the top. I mean, like, who, where, how, what? Like those, I haven't read one or been inspired by one of those yet. Yes. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think you're, you know, thank you for your vulnerability and in, in sharing that because it's the resiliency and the strength and the courage to keep pursuing despite or through that those really low lows, I think is what, you know, stands stands apart from kind of sustainability, right? It, will you be long term? Will you sustain? Will you thrive in the long term? And it's it's really about assessing too, like kind of where you can make some changes, I think, which is also not easy because it's either, I think, you know, we were talking earlier about like comfort, you're in, you get sometimes in a comfort zone, right? Or, or it's, it's just a lot to handle mentally, emotionally, physically, just draining that it's just too much energy to, to change anything, right? So it's never an easy decision. It's never an easy kind of task to, to even make change, but um, pursuing through that, I think, and inspiring stories. And like yourself, I know there's folks that are listening, that are inspired, that are determined now by, you know, your story and your journey and, um, and what, you know, you're doing and sharing this, I think is also opening up that just that hope for, for a lot of women and, and business owners. And so as we kind of you know, come to a close on our time together. Um, what words of wisdom or kind of guidance would you give other Latina women business owners that are either 
thinking about starting their business or have just started their business and, and could be potentially already facing some of the challenges, similar challenges to what you discussed? What, what would you say to those women? Um, I have a few different like sayings in, that have come to mind. Um, and I'm probably not saying them exactly the way that I heard them, but I'm going to try my best. Um, I've seen it, read it, heard it that um, sh like a ship is safe, you know, in the harbor. It's so it's so comfy, cozy in the harbor to, you know, keep that ship just docked there. Um, but that's not what ships are for. Mm. They're not they're not for just hanging out in the harbor. They're meant to go out to sea, right? They're, they're meant to go out there. And, and the only way, here's another saying, that you're going to become a skilled sailor is to have some really choppy waters, like, like calm waters never made a skilled sailor. Like if you're going to be skilled at anything, you have to go through the choppiness, you have to go through the storms, you have to go through all that discomfort that comes with being at the top of your game, right? And I guess my, um, not like my advice, because I really don't have advice, um, <laughs> just my experience is that I just, you got to be willing to start with like where you're at with what you've got it can't be like, um, I started pocha without the skill set. I started pocha way undercapitalized, not the best way to start a business, but I did. And if I had waited, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, I started, you know, with where I was at, with what I had, and the learning is in the doing. You have to be willing to make mistakes. You have to be willing to fall down. You also have to be willing how to develop a rubber butt. Like you're going to fall down and it's just boing, like back up. <laughs> you're going to fall. And the key is, you know, how long are you going to stay down for? Mm. You might stay down for two weeks. Okay. That's too long. Two weeks is too long. You got to learn how to stay down for just, you know, a week, one day one hour soon, you know, when you become skilled enough, you're down for five minutes and you get your butt back up. Like there's no time to be, you know, boohooing. <laughs> like you really have to just keep marching forward and you got to really want it. And I hope I'm not like scaring anyone with all these stories, but just know that es parte de, es parte de, you can't avoid any of this. You can't avoid any of the discomfort, any of the challenge, any of the obstacles, any of the learning. You can't avoid any of it. You just have to be grateful for the journey, grateful for the lessons, grateful for the character building. Like now I don't say like I had a bad day. I, I either had a good day or I had a character building day. Mm. Like there's, there's no bad days. It's just like, oof. well, that was a character building moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And to grow past it and just constantly be working on your leadership, constantly be working on your mindset, constantly be focusing on gratitude, even gratitude for the yucky stuff. You got to be grateful for it because that's what makes you the skilled sailor. Um, and just work on yourself every day. Take care of yourself. You can't pour from an empty cup. You got to take care of yourself. You got to, you know, drink your water, get your eight hours sleep, do the exercise, get a little bit of sunshine, meditate for five minutes. If you can't do 10 or 20, um, you know, just really take care of yourself because when we take care of ourselves, um, we're better equipped to take care of other people. Um, and you just can't pour from an empty cup. You can't give what you don't have. So yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for those analogies that really just brought it to, to life, painted that picture, I think. And, and you're right. You got to invest in yourself, right? You gotta, you gotta add coins to that meter. Yeah. <laughs> my analogies are not as good as yours. <laughs> and I don't know why my mind is going to all of these, like, um, like, uh, ocean and boats and what is, I forgot the word for, uh, a vessel, a sea vessel. I don't know why my mind's going to all of these analogies, um, but a rising tide lifts all boats. And I say that for, for us, for our, 
for our community, for Latinas. Um, we need to be the evidence of success. We need to blaze the trail. When my sister wins, I win. When you win, I win. When we win, we all win together. And it really is, I believe, our social responsibility to get out of our comfort zones and to rise up and take each other with us. A rising tide lifts all boats. So it's my responsibility to keep this tide rising and to take other Latinas with me, show the way, be the success so that I can leave clues for the people that want to rise up with me. That is so beautiful, Claire. We are going to, those are the words of wisdom that we are going to close this interview with and that we are going to leave everyone with. Let those words resonate with you, everyone. Claire, it's been an honor. It's been so beautiful to share this time with you, this space with you and hear your experience, to learn about your journey and just know that we're here cheering you on. We're a champion of you and your mission and your business um, and encouraging everyone to, to go visit Claire, say hello, support her, support her business. And thank you so much, Claire. For thank you. I feel the love. I feel the support um, like never before. And I want to be able to, to give that back to all of you as well. So thank you for this opportunity to share and to contribute. Thank you so much. Well, everybody, until next time, we'll see you all. Thank you. Bye.